Hi everyone and welcome to the second video for integration for the International Baccalaureate course Math Standard. In this video I'm going to go through applications of integration. So here's the topic outline. We're going to look at the fundamental theorem of calculus, the area under a curve, area between two functions, solids of revolution and kinematics. So let's begin with the fundamental theorem of calculus. Consider the curve y equals f of x between the ordinates x equals a and x equals b. So here's our curve y equals f of x. And what I've done here is divided up this interval into little rectangles. So you can see here I've got a rectangle that's got a width of delta x. Delta, of course, in mathematics means change. So this means a change in x, but it's also meant to be a small change. So I've got a width here of delta x, and in fact all of these rectangles have got a width of delta x, and they've got a height of f of x. So that means that the area under the curve is approximately equal to su the sum of all of those rectangles, and we can write it like this. It's the sum from x equals a up to b minus delta x, so that's up to here, of f of x times delta x, because that's the formula for the area of a rectangle. Obviously, the more rectangles we have, the smaller delta x will be, and the better the approximation of the area. Hence, if we take the limit as delta x approaches zero, we're going to get the exact value of the area. And so the actual area is going to be equal to the limit as delta x approaches zero of this sum. And what we're going to do is replace all of this notation with our integral sign. This is the integral sign that we met in the first video. The only difference is it's going to have limits on the integral sign. Let's have a look at how we got from here to here. So as delta x approaches 0, a just becomes a, b minus delta x becomes b, f of x stays the same, and delta x becomes dx. Now we don't want delta x to become 0 because that would wipe the whole thing out. We want delta x to approach 0. So to become the thinnest possible thing that we can imagine, and that's dx. So there are two types of integrals. There's an indefinite integral where we don't have limits on the integral sign. These are the ones that we've been doing in the previous video. And in this case, we just do the integration and then we do plus c. And then there's this one, the definite integral. And it has limits here on the integral sign. And it will represent the area under the curve between these limits. So that brings us to the fundamental theorem of calculus, which states that the integral between a and b of some function f of x dx is equal to the antiderivative, when we've substituted in the upper limit, take away the antiderivative when we've substituted in the lower limit. Let's have a look at how that works. So for example, find the integral between 1 and 3 of 2x dx. So this curve here, or line, is y equals 2x. And so we're finding this grayed out area here. So it's underneath the curve, or in between the curve and the x-axis, between 1 and 3. So all we're going to do here is find the antiderivative, or integrate, 2x, which of course is x squared. And I'm going to change my notation slightly and put it in square brackets. And my 1 and 3 are going to come over this side. You will see other notations out there from other tutors or textbooks, but this is the one that I use. Now I'm going to substitute the 3 in, subtract substitute the 1 in. So it's going to become 3 squared minus 1 squared, which is equal to 8 units squared. And if we just did a simple area of a trapezium formula, we'd find out that that's actually true. Let's have a look at another one. So this one's an indefinite integral. So I'm going to integrate 5x minus 4. So 5x becomes 5x squared on 2, and the minus 4 becomes minus 4x, and we must remember the c. In this case, we're going to have 4x cubed on 3. I'm going to put it in square brackets and I'm going to move the limits over. Now you've probably got a question. What about the plus c here? We don't actually need it. We could put the plus c in, but when I substitute the 2 in and then subtract, substitute the 0 in, the c's will actually cancel out. So with a definite integral, you don't have to worry about the constant. You only need to worry about that with an indefinite integral. Let's finish this one off, put the 2 in, 
and I'm actually not going to put this last bit in. I could put minus zero if you wanted to. It's not all that important. Um, tidying that up, 4 times 8 divided by 3 is going to be equal to 32 over 3. And that's our answer. Now there are two things to be aware of. The first thing is when you get a zero on the integral sign, like here. In a lot of cases, maybe most cases, when you go to do that subtraction, it will be equal to zero. But that's not the case with e to the x or cos x. e to the zero is one, cos zero is one. So just be careful with those two. The other thing to be aware of is when you get multiple terms. So you might have two terms here, for instance. When you go to do that subtraction of the second limit, you want to put it in brackets because you want to subtract all of it. Here's the first one, so it's an e one. Now this is a nice easy question. We're just going to integrate e to the x, which gives us e to the x, and I move the limits over. Now I'm going to substitute that two in, subtract, substitute the zero in, like this. So the temptation here is just to not put that one in at all because we think that zero going into there is going to give us zero. And in a lot of cases it will. You know, if they're power terms like x squared or x to the fourth, they will be zero. But not in this case. That's one. So our answer is e squared minus one. We always leave our answer as an exact value, if possible, and in simplest form. Okay, here's another one. Integral between zero and pi on two of sine x dx. Okay, now when I integrate sine, I'm going to get cos, but it is a positive cos or negative cos. The way to work that out is to go back and think about what happens when you differentiate. So when I differentiate cos, I get negative sine. So when I integrate sine, I'm going to get negative cos. So it's going to be negative cos x in brackets between 0 and pi on 2. Substitute it in, and when you subtract the substitution of 0, make sure you write that down as well. Got lots of negatives here as, as well, haven't I? So I've got negative cos pi on 2, take away negative cos 0. Okay, cos pi on 2, if you don't have a calculator, try and remember the curve. Here it is. And there is pi on 2, so it's 0. It's gone. And cos 0, of course, is 1. So this is negative, negative 1, which is positive 1. Okay, so here's one that's got multiple terms. The integral between 0 and pi on 2 of e to the x minus sine x on 2 dx. Let's integrate. Integral of e to the x is e to the x. Integral of negative sine is positive cos. And this 2 here, or a half, is just going to hang around. All right, we're going to substitute the pi on 2 in, subtract, substitute the 0 in, and that's where I want the brackets, like this. Because I want to take, I want all of this to be negative, or all of this to be taken away from that. Okay, look what we've got here. I'm going to leave that alone. Cos pi on 2, we decided was 0, so that's gone. Um, what else have we got? e to the naught is 1. Cos the naught is 1. So I've got e to the pi on 2 minus 1, minus a half, which is e to the pi on 2, take away 3 halves. Now let's look at another way that they can phrase this sort of question. Rather than giving you an integral, they can say, find the area between the curve y equals 1 minus x squared and the x-axis. So if we drew that curve, 1 minus x squared, it's going to be this little area here. So it's going to be between negative 1 and 1, the integral of 1 minus x squared dx. So there it is there. It's going to be the same process. We're going to do our integration, so that becomes x. This becomes negative x cubed on 3. It's in between negative 1 and 1. We substitute our 1 in, subtract, substitute our negative 1 in. Be careful of your brackets here. In fact, I've put both of them in brackets. So 1 minus a third is a bit ugly. Take away whatever this is, minus 1 plus a third. When you tidy that all up, we get 4 thirds. But you can be smart. This is symmetrical. So this area here is equal to this area here. So instead of going between negative 1 and 1 and having to do all that fraction work, you could say it's the same as two lots of this area between 0 and 1, like this. And that's actually an easier question to do. But that brings us to an important point. 
area is positive, just like speed and distance. I suppose we had to find the area between the curve y equals x squared minus 1 and the x-axis. Well, that's here. But when I set up the integral, that's going to be negative. There's a couple of different ways to do it. We can recognise that it's negative and do the absolute values straight from the get-go. Or you can work all the way through and when you find out that it's negative, then you can say, but area is positive, so the answer is 4 thirds. I've done something sneaky as well. Can you see it? I've done two lots of the integral between 0 and 1. So I can show you actually how much easier this is. All right, next line. The 2 is coming out the front. It's already positive. And I'm integrating this x cubed on 3, take away x. Substitute the 1 in, take away, substitute the 0 in, which is 0. So that's going to give us a third, take 1. That is indeed negative. That's negative 2 thirds. Strip the negative off. 2 times 2 thirds is 4 thirds. Look at these two questions. Find the area under the curve y equals x squared minus 1 between the ordinates x equals negative 1 and x equals 1. That's the question that we just did. The answer was 4 thirds units squared. This question, find the integral between negative 1 and 1 of x squared minus 1 dx. Is that the same question? It almost is. Does it have the same answer? No. The answer to that is negative 4 thirds. Do you know why? It's all to do with the way they've asked the question. In this case, they're asking for the area. They're asking for a physical quantity that can't be negative. So if you get a negative, you've got to strip it off and say the area is 4 thirds units squared. Here, they're just asking you for an exercise in algebra or calculus, really. So the answer to this is negative 4 thirds. This has nothing to do with area because it doesn't say it. You might also have noticed how I've only put the unit squared for this answer. Okay, we don't put it here because it's not area. Which brings us to this. Given an integral can be negative, we could have the situation where areas cancel one another out. Like this question. Find the area between the curve y equals x, and then in brackets x minus 1, in brackets x minus 2, and the ordinates x equals 0 and x equals 2. Now, if we were just asked for the integral, between 0 and 2 of this function, it would be equal to 0. But because we're asked for the area, we can see that the area is not 0. So this is the integral here. I've already started to expand this out, because remember, we don't have a product rule. So all I've done is x squared minus x. Now I'm going to do FOIL and tidy it up. And there is our integral between 0 and 2 of x cubed minus 3x squared plus 2x dx. A couple of different ways we could do this. We could do the integral between 0 and 1 and then add it to the absolute value of the integral between 1 and 2. But I am recognising that these two areas are symmetrical, so I could just do two lots of that. So our area is going to be two lots of the integral between 0 and 1 of x cubed minus 3x squared plus 2x dx. So integrating, I'm going to get x to the fourth on 4, take x cubed plus x squared between 0 and 1. Now substitute our 1 in and then take away what we get when we substitute our 0 in and we're going to end up with a half units squared. Now we can use the graphics display calculator to do an integral. We'll only do a definite integral. It won't work out an indefinite one. But that's better than nothing. What you do is you go into run and then F4 for math and then use F, do F6 which is your arrow, your right arrow across. And then what you'll see on above F1 is the integral. So you can see that integral here, dx. All right, and you go into there. So suppose we wanted to work this out. This was our integral between 0 and 2 of x, then x minus 1, x minus 2 dx. There's a little bit of fiddling around with your arrows to get into these limits and everything. And make sure you use x, not times. But when you hit enter, you're going to get 0. So not surprisingly, as I said before, the value of this integral is equal to 0. If we want to work out the area, then we could do two lots of between 1 and 0, blah, 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 blah. That gives us a half, which was the answer that we got. Or you could do it separately like this. So you can see I've got the beginning part there between 0 and 1. 
and then I've done plus the absolute value. Now, absolute value is actually in the same menu, that same math menu. You just don't F6 arrow across. So it's sitting here above F3. So you put the absolute value in, then arrow across and get your integral. And we get a half. Here's a past exam question. The diagram shows the graph of y equals f of x with intercepts of x equals negative 1, 0, 3, and 4. The area of shaded region R1 is 2, and the area of shaded region R2 is 3. It is given that the integral between 0 and 4 of f of x dx is equal to 10. What is the value of the integral between negative 1 and 3 of f of x dx? This question is really asking if you understand that area is positive and an integral can be negative, which makes it a really cool question. Let's begin with this first line. The area of the shaded region R1 is equal to 2. So that means because it's below the x-axis, the value of the integral between negative 1 and 0 of f of x dx is negative 2. That's the same with this one. Because region 2 is below the x-axis, the integral between 3 and 4 of f of x dx is negative 3. It's given that the integral between 0 and 4 of f of x dx is equal to 10. So this plus negative 3 is going to equal 10. So there's our integral there. It's equal to the integral between 0 and 3 of f of x dx. That's the thing that we want to figure out. Minus 3 is equal to 10. Can you see that this thing must be 13? Let's write that in. It's actually positive, so that's nice. Finally, what is the value of the integral between negative 1 and 3 of f of x dx? So this bit and this bit. So this is negative, remember, so it's going to be 13. Take away 2, which is 11. Moving on to the area between two curves. If we want to find the area between two curves, we subtract the bottom area from the top area. So in that case, it means working out this area under the curve y equals f of x, and then subtracting the area under the curve y equals g of x. So area is equal to the integral between a and b of f of x dx minus the integral between a and b of g of x dx. Here's an example. Find the area bounded by f of x equals x squared and g of x equals 3x minus 2. So that's this little piece here. First thing we need to do is find the points of intersection. Now we can see from the graph that they are 1, 1 and 2, 4. And we're only interested in the x coordinates. You can do it graphically or algebraically, but if you don't have a graph, we could just solve these simultaneously. So x squared equals 3x minus 2. Take these over the other side, factorize, and solve. x is equal to 1 or 2. Let's set up our integral. It's going to be integral between 1 and 2 of g of x take f of x dx. It's important to put the curve that's on top first. Substituting in, g of x is 3x minus 2, f of x is x squared. Now let's integrate. It's going to give us 3x squared on 2 minus 2x minus x cubed on 3. Between the limits of 1 and 2. Be careful when you do the subtraction here. We're going to need to put the second part in brackets like this. It's a little bit ugly. Tidying that up, though, we get 1 sixth unit squared. Here's another example. Find the area of the region enclosed by the curves f of x equals 2 and x minus 1 and g of x equals 3 minus x all over 2. You might be looking at this question and be concerned about the fact that it dips below the x-axis. And you might be thinking, I've got to split this into two somehow or other and take the absolute value of part of it and add it to another bit. You don't have to do that between two curves. I'm not going to go into too much detail about why, but if you want to play around with it, add a constant to both of these, like say 5, and move that whole area up here. When you do the integral between those two, you're going to get the exact same answer as in between these two. So you don't need to worry about it between two curves. In between one curve and the x-axis, you do have to worry about whether it's negative or positive. So again, if we're not given a graph, we're going to have to find the points of intersection algebraically. So we're going to put 2 on x minus 1 equal to 3 minus x all over 2. Now I'm going to just turn this into one fraction. So this is going to become x over x. So it'll be 2 minus x on x 
is equal to 3 minus x on 2. Cross multiply gives us 2 outside of 2 minus x is equal to x outside of 3 minus x. Expand gives us 4 minus 2x equals 3x minus x squared. And then let's take it all over to the left-hand side and tidy it up and finally factorise. A lot of work in this, isn't there? x is equal to 1 and 4. So let's set up the integral. It's going to be the integral between 1 and 4 of g of x take f of x. Now, if you don't know which one's on top, there's a couple of different things you could do. If you can't graph it, you could test a point. You know, test x equals 2 and see which one's bigger. If that's not going to work for you, do it one way or the other, and then if it ends up being negative, say, therefore, the area is, and strip the negative off. That's another method. Anyway, we happen to know that g of x is on top, so it's 3 minus x on 2. Take away all of this, so that's going to go in brackets. Okay, tidying this up because we need to go term by term. I'm going to split this here. So it's going to give us 3 on 2, take x on 2, and then I'm going to expand these brackets. Negative 2 on x plus 1. And then I've just joined those two constants together. It gives us 5 on 2. So we're going to integrate 5 on 2, take x on 2, take 2 on x. That's going to give us 5 on 2x, take away x squared on 4. And of course, when we integrate 2 on x, we get 2 log base e x and it's in between 1 and 4. All right again when you're substituting in the 1 and the 4 be careful because when you substitute this 1 in you've got three terms you want to put that all in brackets. Okay just be patient when you do this. 5 over 2 times 4 is 20 over 2 which is 10. Take away 16 divide 4 is 4. Take away 2 log 4 take away and then in brackets putting the one in now this is a little easier five on two take one quarter take two log one that of course is zero there okay doing some tidy up so we've got six take two base log base e of four take away and then five halves take away a quarter is nine and four and then just joining these two together we get 15 on four take away two log four okay now we're up to solids of revolution so, so far we've just been looking at the area under a curve. Now we're going to look at what happens if we take that area and rotate it 360 degrees about the x-axis. It's going to become a solid. This is the formula that we use to find the volume of a solid revolution. It's v is equal to pi, the integral between a and b of y squared dx. It's a little different to what we've been using for area. Firstly, it's got a pi. Secondly, it's got a squared here. Now, that's the same. It's normally f of x dx. And remember, y is f of x. But this one is different because it is squared. Now, it comes from the idea that this solid is made up of an infinite number of disks or circles or slices. And all of them have got an area of pi r squared. Look, pi r squared. Look at one of these circles. What's the radius? It's y, or f of x, isn't it? So just like we did with area, if these little circles have got a very, very tiny height, you know, they're paper thin, and we find the limit of those, which is this little dx thing here, then we've got the volume of the solid. So that's where the formula comes from. Here's an example, find the volume of the solid formed when the area beneath the line y equals 2x is rotated about the x-axis between x equals 0 and x equals 2. So the first thing we're going to do is set up our integral. So it's going to be the volume is equal to pi, the integral between 0 and 2, they're our x-coordinates. And I want to square this function, so I'm taking the 2x and squaring it, and then I'm going to integrate it with respect to x. Let's tidy that up. That's going to be 4x squared. And now what we've got to do is do the integral. So this is going to become 4x cubed on 3. And it's exactly the same. The limits come over the other side. I'm going to substitute the 2 in, then subtract what I get when I substitute the 0 in, which is 0. So that's 32 pi on 3. And in this case, it's units cubed, okay, because it's a volume. This solid will actually be a cone. We can actually confirm that the volume is correct by just using the formula. So the volume of a cone is a third pi r squared h. 
r in this case is this distance here, which is 4, and the height of the cone is 2. Substituting them in, I get 16 times 2, which is 32 pi on 3 units cubed. So it is true. Here's another example. Find the volume of the solid formed when the area between the curve y equals x, and then in brackets x plus 2, and the x-axis is rotated 360 degrees about the x-axis. So that's this area here. Now, probably the first thing you're saying to me is, it's going to be negative. And actually it's not. Okay, volume won't be negative. And that's mainly because our formula has got a y squared in it. So we're going to square out any negatives that we get. The area is negative, but when you take this area and you rotate it around, you get a positive volume. Okay, so it wouldn't matter if we did this curve here or if we flipped this whole thing upside down and did that curve there, we'd get the same answer. Let's set up the integral. Volume is equal to pi and then integral between negative 2 and 0 of y squared dx. And when I substitute this in, I'm going to square all of this. Now let's expand this out because we don't have a product rule. That gives us x squared plus 4x plus 4. And then expanding through again, we get x to the fourth plus 4x cubed plus 4x squared dx. Okay, just like we've been doing the whole time, we're going to do the integral of this and then move these limits over the other side. So it becomes x to the fifth on 5 plus, this is x to the fourth plus 4x cubed on 3 in between negative 2 and 0. This is a funny one. When I substitute the 0 in, I'm going to get 0. Take away then I'm going to have to substitute in my minus 2. So I'm still going to have to put brackets around it like this. Oh, it's a bit disgusting, isn't it? I've got the pi at the front, 0, take away. All right, I've got negative 2 to the 5th on 5 plus negative 2 to the 4th plus 4 times negative 2 cubed on 3. Tidying that all up, and we get that. And then finally it's going to be equal to 16 pi on 15. Okay, here's a past exam question. Let f of x equal negative 0.8x squared plus 0.5 in between negative 0.5 and positive 0.5. Mark uses f of x as a model to create a barrel. The region enclosed by the graph of f, the x-axis, the line x equals negative 0.5 and the line x equals 0.5 is rotated about 360 degrees about the x-axis. This is shown in the diagram. Okay, so we're taking this part here, this area here, and we're rotating it about the x-axis. A, use the model to find the volume of the barrel. So we're just going to set up the integral. It's going to go between negative 0.5 and positive 0.5, and I want to square this. Now the shortcut here, you can see that this is symmetrical, so we can just go between 0 and 0.5 and double it if we want to. You don't have to. Just saves you on calculations later on when you've got to substitute this negative 0.5 in. All right, so instead of this, I'm going to do two lots of the integral between 0 and 0.5. I need to expand that out. I'm going to go this thing squared plus this times this times this plus the last thing squared. And there it is. Now integrate. I'm going to get 0.64x to the fifth on 5 minus... 0.8x cubed on 3 plus 0.25x. Substitute in your 0.5. I don't need to worry about the 0. And tidying it all up, I get 287 pi on 1500, which is approximately equal to 0.601 metres cubed. B. The empty barrel is being filled with water. The volume V metres cubed of water in the barrel after T minutes is given by V equals 0.8, and in brackets 1 minus E to the negative 0.1T. How long will it take for the barrel to be half full? So half full is going to be 0.301 metres cubed, and we just need to substitute that in for the volume there. Now what remains is to try and solve this equation. Divide both sides by 0.8. And now I'm going to take this thing over this side and this thing over this side and turn it all around like that. You might need to do another step, that's okay. Logs of both sides gives us negative 0.1t equals ln 0.624. And then finally divide by negative 
t is equal to 4.71 minutes. Okay, we're up to the last section. So recall that velocity is the derivative of displacement and acceleration is the derivative of velocity. And that means that displacement is the antiderivative or the integral of velocity and velocity is the antiderivative of acceleration. So given that displacement is the antiderivative of velocity, we can find the distance travelled by a particle by using the definite integral. So our distance travelled is going to be the integral between time 1 and time 2 of the absolute value of velocity with respect to t. So we take the absolute value because distance is always positive. Here's a velocity time graph. Now these can be a bit tricky to read. It's not a displacement time graph. So this is not I am travelling away from home, then I rest for a period, then I travel away from home, then I turn around, then I come back home, because it's not displacement, it's velocity. This is I'm speeding up away from wherever I started, so I'm speeding up, I'm accelerating. Then I'm travelling at a constant speed, I'm still travelling. Then I'm speeding up again, and then I'm slowing down, decelerating, until I stop. But the good thing about it is the distance travelled is the area under the graph. So we could just split this up into geometrical shapes and find the area of them, just like this. So the total distance travelled is 725 metres. Like I said, distance isn't negative. So distance travelled is going to equal the sum of the areas between the graph and the x-axis. So it's going to be this area here plus this area here. So remember this question from the first video? I've modified it slightly to make it a bit easier. The particle starts at 1, moves to the right until it reaches 5, and then turns, and when it reaches negative 4, it stops. So we could be asked to find the distance that it travelled. That's pretty easy from this. We just need to add it. So remember it started here at 1, it went to 5, so that's 4 units, and then it turns and goes all the way down to negative 4. So it's just going to be 4 plus 9, which is 13 units. But often the questions are stated in terms of time, not displacement. So we could get this. The particle starts at 1, moves to the right for 2 seconds, then turns, heads left for another 3 seconds, then stops. What's the distance that it's travelled? We would be given an equation of displacement, such as this. We could graph it. And if you turn your head sideways, you'll see that we're sort of getting the same question. It's heading to the right, up to here, then it turns, and then it comes back to the left. And just by looking at those distances there, it's travelled 4 units to the right, and then 9 units to the left. And 4 plus 9 is 13, so we get the same answer. If we're only given the equation for displacement like this, we could find the velocity function and then find the area between the graph and the x-axis. So here's the derivative, x dashed of t is equal to negative 2t plus 4. It's pretty easy to graph. I mean, you've still got to graph it, don't get me wrong. But you would find then this area here, just using triangles, area of a triangle, and then this area here. And it's a little bit of calculation. It's half times base times height plus half times the base times the height. And that will give you 4 plus 9, which is indeed 13 units. Here's an exam question. A particle P moves along a straight line. The velocity V metres per second of P after T seconds is given by V of T equals 7 cos T minus 5 T to the cos T for 0 is less than or equal to T is less than or equal to 7. The following diagram shows the graph of V. Find the initial velocity of P. Now, this is a nice easy question. We just have to substitute in T equals 0. Substituting it in, we get 7 cos 0 minus 5 times 0 to the cos 0. If you're concerned about what that's equal to, just put in your calculator. This is a calculator question, um, but that's actually equal to 0. So it's just 7 cos 0. Cos 0 is 1, so the answer is 7. D, find the maximum speed of P. Now, this is a bit of a trick question. It's really asking if you understand that speed is only ever positive. Because it's pretty easy to look at this graph and go, well, there's the maximum speed, it's the maximum velocity. Well, that's not true, though. Maximum speed occurs when the absolute value 
of velocity is greatest. So it could be here or it could be here. Now we could go and try and maximise this. I know that you're taught you know, to look for this word and then differentiate it, put it equal to zero, but that's a horrendous thing there to try and differentiate. This was in the calculator paper. So all we're going to do is put it in the graphics display calculator in the graph part and then find the minimum. So that point there occurs when time is equal to 6.4 and there's its value there. So the absolute value of that is 24.7. It's much bigger than 7. So at t equals 0, the velocity is 7. At t equals 6.4, the velocity is negative 24.7. So 24.7 is the maximum speed. C. Write down the number of times that acceleration of p is 0 metres per second. Now remember when acceleration is equal to 0, we've got an inflection. We've got a change in concavity. But that's not going to help us here because we don't have a graph of displacement. We've got a graph of velocity. So this is the first derivative of velocity. So we want turning points. How many turning points do we have? One, two, three. So acceleration is equal to the derivative of velocity. And if it's equal to zero, then there is a turning point on the velocity curve. This happens three times. D, find the acceleration of P when it changes direction. Okay, remember this is a velocity curve. When V is positive, the particle is heading in a positive direction. When V is negative, it's heading in a negative direction. So if the particle is heading in a positive direction and then is suddenly turning, suddenly heading in a negative direction, then it's turned around. So it's here that it's turned. So we want to know the acceleration when it changes direction. The first thing we're going to need to find out is when that happens. So on our graphics calculator, we're going to find the root of the equation. So there it is there. So it happens at t is equal to 0.864. If we want to find the acceleration now, remember we can't differentiate that. What we're going to do is use the trace on the calculator. So you hit F1 for trace and then you start typing in this root. You can with the trace function use your arrows, but it's not going to be accurate enough. And even 0.864 wasn't accurate enough. I actually put in quite a lot of decimal places. So when I put that much in, providing you've got your derivative turned on, which is in your settings, then you're going to get the derivative. Derivative of velocity is acceleration. There's our answer there, negative 9.246. So our acceleration is negative 9.25 metres per second squared. E, find the total distance travelled by P. Okay, so this is going to be the area under the curve, isn't it? So this area plus this area here and we'll have to take the absolute value of this. So it's the area under the curve between 0 and 7 and we're going to split it up into two bits. So the integral between 0 and 0.864 and the absolute value of the integral between 0.864 and 7. Again we didn't, weren't able to differentiate this, we certainly can't integrate it so we're going to use our graphics display calculator to find this answer. So there it is there. So remember we're going to run F4 for math and right arrow. We're not doing this from the graph part of the graphics calculator. And we're going to end up with this sort of thing here. I'm just going to do it in two bits. I'm going to do that bit and then that bit and get rid of the negative and then add them together. So there it is there. Gives us 3.318. And then putting in this other one I get negative 60.57. So our answer is 3.318 plus 60.569. Add them together, I get 63.9 metres. And that brings us to the end of this topic.